What does unforgivable sin or sinning against the Holy Spirit mean that Matthew 12 verse 31 and 32 speak of? And so, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Welcome back to the channel everyone. Today, we're diving deep into a topic that resonates with many of us on a personal level, unforgiven sin. From the weight it carries in our hearts to the questions it raises about redemption and spiritual growth, unforgiven sin is a complex and often challenging aspect of our lives. In this video, we'll explore what unforgiven sin truly means, its consequences, and most importantly, how we can find healing and liberation from its grip. So, grab a seat, open your hearts, and let's embark on this journey together. The issue of sin against the Holy Spirit is mentioned by Christ in the context of healing a blind and dumb demoniac, Matthew 12 verses 22 to 32, Mark 3 verses 20 to 30. This healing led all the multitude following Jesus to wonder if he was not perhaps the son of David. But the Pharisees, jealous of Jesus' popularity, objected, he does not cast out demons except by the power of Beelzebub, the chieftain of demons, Matthew 12 verses 23 and 24. It is evident that the Pharisees attributed to Satan the work that the Spirit of God was doing through Christ. To better understand the subject, it is necessary to remember that one of the most important works of the Holy Spirit is to lead human beings to repentance of their sins and to accept Christ as Savior and Lord. But this work ends up being neutralized in the lives of those who persistently resist the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Thus they grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4 verse 30, and quench his influence upon the individual conscience, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19. With hearts hardened by pride, Hebrews 3 verses 7 to 15, they lose their spiritual sensibilities and moral perceptions and end up forming a distorted scale of values in which the work of the Holy Spirit is often attributed to Satan and Satan's work to the Holy Spirit. In the scriptures, we find several instances of people who have sinned against the Holy Spirit. For example, Pharaoh, before whom Moses and Aaron performed great signs and wonders, hardened his heart to the point that the Spirit of God no longer had access to him, Exodus 5-12. Judas Iscariot did not, despite Christ's warnings, Matthew 26 verses 21 to 25 allow the Holy Spirit to dissuade him from betraying the Master. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit and were punished for it, Acts 5 verses 1 to 11. Undoubtedly, these people were lost because they did not allow the Holy Ghost to lead them to repentance. On the other hand, the Bible also mentions some individuals who turned away from God and later repented. Samson, of whom it is said that he did not know yet that the Lord had departed from him, Judges 16 verse 20, then cried out and his prayer was answered. His name appears among the heroes of the faith, Hebrews 11 verse 32. Manasseh was perhaps the worst Hebrew king, but after being taken captive by the Assyrian army, he humbled himself before God and undertook a significant religious reform in Judah. These examples reveal that even seemingly hopeless cases can be reversed if a person humbles himself before God and cries out for help. The problem with the Pharisees, mentioned above, is that pride and self-sufficiency had hardened them to the point that they no longer perceived Christ's miracles as signs wrought by the Spirit of God to evidence the coming of the Kingdom of God. Since repentance is the condition for the forgiveness of sins, they would never be forgiven if they continued to attribute to Satan the very work of the Holy Spirit done to bring them to repentance. In view of this, we can conclude that the sin against the Holy Spirit is never acknowledging one's own mistakes. As long as the person recognizes that they are wrong and that they must change, they can be sure that they have not gone too far. Those who inquire whether they have not committed the unpardonable sin show by this attitude that their conscience has not completely lost its sensibility. When a person no longer recognizes his own mistakes, he finds himself on a dangerous path. Still, we must not lose hope. Experiences such as those of Samson and Manasseh reveal that even totally degenerate people can return to God if they allow the Holy Spirit to do His regenerating work. As we conclude this discussion on unforgiven sin, I hope you found clarity and comfort in knowing that forgiveness and redemption are always within reach. 
Remember, we're all human, prone to mistakes, but it's how we confront and reconcile them that defines our growth. As we part ways today, I encourage you to reflect on your own journey towards forgiveness and extend grace to yourself and others.